Our Father, we thank you because you are a God of love and a God of purpose too. And there is no life here this morning that does not have a divine purpose before it and behind it. And Father, we have just prayed that you will use every one of us. You will teach every one of us. You will lead every one of us. You will give us sweet rest from the confusion of the world. You will prepare us a threshing instrument. You will prepare us to go before you and speak the words that you have imparted. Whatever our past shortcomings, past inadequacies, we know that you are well able to transform every one of us to the strong leaders that we ought to be. Therefore, Father, we are praying you will strengthen every one of us in Jesus' name. We pray that the consciousness of failures in the past and the consciousness that we have not done everything we ought to have done perfectly, that this morning, you will remove that consciousness away from us in Jesus' name. And you will help us to see a great God who is able to make a great instrument out of little, little people like us. Father, we ourselves are small, but we trust in a great God with a great power, with a great plan, with a great purpose. And therefore, Lord, we pray that big picture, that great thing you have in heart concerning the least of us here and every one of us here, you will bring to fulfillment in Jesus' name. <laughs> Lord, if the devil will bring unnecessary accusation on what you had already taken care of and removed, and therefore is tying us down, binding us, and weeping us at the head, saying that we'll never rise up to become the leaders we ought to be. Father, we pray you cancel it in Jesus' name. Because Jesus is the Lamb of God. And his blood cleanses and washes whiter than snow. Paul did a lot of injury to the church but you made something out of that man. Therefore, Lord, we are praying. You are the same God. You have not changed. Lord Jesus, the same yesterday, today, and forever. We pray that you will be mightily present here this day and encourage those who are discouraged. Strengthen those who are weak. Lead those who have gone astray. Open the eyes of those who are blind. And those who are unbelieving because their faith is wavering, Lord, increase our faith. Yeah. We have a great work ahead of us. And we are the people you have chosen to do that work. Lord, we shall do it. Yeah. We may not be strong in ourselves, but we are strong in the Lord and in the power of his mind. May we see you more clearly. And the vision we have of Christ will make the Spirit of God to rise up within us that we're able to march ahead and lead the way before the people of God. Thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. The session we have now is on leadership studies and will be keeping to the outline. There is much on the outline, so I'll be by and large looking into the outline and we'll be sharing together from all these things that have been put down. But there are so many references in the explanatory notes and in the various sections that we will not be able to read all the references. 
But I trust, as you are leaders called of God, and you want to be your best in leadership, that you will take these outlines on your own too, and that your spare time, you will go through some of the references we may not have the time to read. Our overlooking or not reading a particular reference does not mean that that reference is not important. It just means that we cannot read everything and therefore we are trusting you and having confidence in you that you will take the time because we know you have much interest to develop the leadership quality that God has placed on you. Um, we're now on page 6. The Bible and human history both give abundant evidence that no church and no group of people can rise above the level of quality of its leadership. Nations and also churches rise and fall according to the ability and the maturity of its leadership. This is the reason why Moses prayed before he left. He knew that he was going. And there were a lot of things I believe he could have been praying about. You are teachers of the word yourself. And you are leaders of God's people. And there are many prayer requests that a leader has for the people of God. And if we look at the life of Moses and the history of the children of Israel, there were a lot of things that Moses could have been praying about at this time. For example, he had given them the law as God gave him. He could have been praying that, oh God, that these children of Israel, as they have deviated so often, will not deviate from the law of God. That would have been a good prayer. He could have been praying that all the enemy nations around will not overcome the people of Israel because he himself had said, or he said in Deuteronomy, that these seven nations, and he mentioned them, they are mightier and greater than the children of Israel. So he could have been praying for that. He could have been praying for, let's say, unity among them, the children of Israel, because he knew the experiences he had gone through. He, had been, he could have been praying for their consistency in the way of the Lord. Those prayers are very important, very legitimate. But then he had a special request. In Numbers chapter 27, from verse 15, And Moses spake unto the Lord. He was praying. When you pray, you are speaking to the Lord. And Moses spake unto the Lord, saying, Let the Lord, the God of the spirits of all flesh, set a man over the congregation, which may go out before them, which may go in before them, and which may lead them out, and which may bring them in, and that the congregation of the Lord be not a sheep which have no shepherd. Now, here Moses prayed for the congregation. You know, he called the whole nation a congregation. Have you ever thought about it? That if the whole nation, this nation, were following the Lord, there will still be a leader leading the nation as a congregation. And even though you may have many states, you may have many regions, you may have many tribes, yet we'll still be talking about congregation. And here, the millions of the children of Israel, they were to be led, they were to be fed, they were to be controlled, they were to be directed, and Moses knew that he was soon believing. And he prayed and said, Lord, the God of the spirits of all flesh, set a man over the congregation, and that man over the congregation will go out before them. He will come in before them. He will lead them out. He will bring them in. He said, Lord, if you don't do that, 
then the congregation of the Lord is not the congregation of the man, but the congregation of the Lord will be a sheep which have no shepherd. Here Moses reveals to us the importance of leadership in the nation and the importance of leadership in the church. Let's look at Judges chapter 2. Judges chapter 2 from verse 7. And the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders that outlived Joshua who had seen all the great works of the Lord that he did for Israel. Can I tell you something? I told you that Moses prayed that God will set a man over the congregation of the Lord. I told you there were many prayers he could have prayed at that time. But can I tell you that God answered the prayer of Moses and he gave a leader unto Israel. And in that single answer for the prayer of the right leader, the proper person, the God-appointed person, God at the same time answered all other prayers. I told you you could have prayed that the children of Israel will abide by the law of the Lord. God answered that prayer too. Because you see the people serve the Lord all the days of Joshua. I told you that you could have prayed that the people will be united so that all the divisions he had seen in the people, all in the wilderness, that all those things will not be there again. But the Lord answered that prayer to you in giving them the right leader. The people served the Lord in unity of mind and oneness all the days of Joshua. He could have said, he could have prayed a prayer that all these enemy nations will not conquer the people of Israel. God answered that to you. In just answering the single prayer of giving them the right leader, then all the other and all those nations were not able to overcome them. And we're praying that God will supply the needs of his people, all that is answered to you, in giving them the right leader. All the needs they could have been praying about, all those things were answered. And all the days of the elders that outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great works of the Lord that he did for Israel. So then, it means it is so very important that we pray for the leadership. Where leadership is already existing, that we pray that God will fulfill his purpose for the leadership he has placed in those communities, in those churches. Where leadership has not been installed or has not been ordained in a particular place, we need to pray that God will send his own man, his own person, his own appointed servant, so that the people of God will not be like sheep without shepherd. I'm going back to the outline. One of the greatest needs in the church of Jesus Christ today is the need for biblical leadership. Our prayer is that God will raise up good, strong, and spiritually matured leadership. And if we pray, God will answer. Only God can raise up leaders of godly character, of divine ability, and of spiritual wisdom to lead his flock. Jesus Christ, our Savior, the Lord, and the perfect example, spent much time training the twelve. And now we ought to take cue from what Jesus Christ did. And we ought to spend much quality time like we're doing this weekend so that we put much into our leaders and we train our leaders and we bring all possible training that we can bring by example, by demonstration, by instruction, by seminars, by special programs like this and in whatever area the Lord will lead us so that we know that the leaders are not being neglected in being well trained. The Lord has never, the church has never yet experienced a greater spiritual impact from her leadership 
than from the leadership of the first century church. What I'm saying is this, that the quality of leadership in the early church was so good, so strong, that the church has never been stronger than the early church. Although the church today, I don't mean deeper life alone, I mean the church at large, may have a lot of facilities, a lot of techniques, a lot of methods, yet the early church experienced something very great. You know why? Jesus concentrated much on the leadership and he trained those people. And if we, on a national level, will train our leadership to make the church strong, on the international level, wherever we have deeper life, if God will help all of us, I don't mean just myself, if God will help all of us as a church to train the leadership of the church that are associated with this particular church, I believe it will make the church strong. And if the church in every state, as a whole state, will make sure that the leadership is well trained, as Jesus concentrated on the leadership in the, uh, around him, I believe that it will make the church strong. And in every region, if we will concentrate on training leadership, the results, the reward, and the impact on the church will be very, very great. And of course, in the local assembly, if the church will concentrate on its leadership, that is why we would have expected that the pastor in a church will not just say, my Sunday message is very important for me. My Tuesday Bible study or Monday Bible study is very important for me. And my revival hour message is very important. And I prepare myself so that I can minister to the people. And then when it comes to the Saturday workers meeting, there is no structure. There is no plan. There is no vision. There is nothing that says, this is what I want to develop out of these leaders. It means that we are giving our best effort to the generality of the membership, and we're giving less to the leadership in the local church. So, we must make sure that we act like the Lord Jesus Christ and spend much time and share very much and impact the lives of the leadership that God has placed around us. As Jesus spent so much time in preparing those leaders, so must the church do today. And when I say the church, I mean you. You represent the church. You are the leaders of the church. And as Jesus did in training people, so must you do. Since God has given you this responsibility of being a leader over the flock of the Lord. Let's look at Mark. Chapter 3 and verse 14. And he ordained twelve that they should be with him, and that he might send them forth to preach. He ordained twelve. Why did he ordain them? Why did he call them? Ultimately, that they will be able to go out and preach. But then they will be with him first. And see him. And note his life. And see how he handles problems. See when he's tired. See when he's weary. See when, he's, uh, when people persecute him. See when it was the intention of the Pharisees to frustrate him. See when they asked him embarrassing questions. And see how he answered all those questions. Go along with him while he raised the dead while he preached the gospel, while he healed the sick. See his attitude to the Gentiles. See his attitude to political people. Learn by example. Learn by instruction. He gave them opportunity to ask their questions. And no question ever seemed foolish, ever seemed embarrassing, that he wouldn't answer. And then, even when their faith was small, he will teach them by manifesting a great faith. 
And then they might ask a question, or even if they did not ask a question, he will use that situation, and he will still be training them that they should be with him. And how the church today should examine the method of the Lord Jesus Christ and see that we will need to train people, train people, so that they will be the kind of leaders they ought to be. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men, who shall be able to teach others also. Well, Paul the Apostle himself said, the Lord Jesus taught him. Then he said, he taught Timothy, among many other witnesses. Then he said, this Timothy should also teach faithful men. And these faithful men will teach others also. You see, it's not supposed to end with Jesus alone, that Jesus taught the twelve. And he taught a person like Paul the Apostle. And now Paul is just to get all that knowledge, have a monopoly of it. He's the only one that can do this right. He's the only one that can do that right. No, Paul also was supposed to share and to train and to bring up. And he trained quite a number of people. And then he said, don't let it stop with you. And here we are. By the grace of God, we have been training you. The leadership of the church we have impacted so much into you. And when you go back to the local church, don't hold those things all to yourself alone. Make sure that you also make these things available and you train other people. The more God strengthens you, the more God enlightens you, the more God makes you to know what direction to follow as a leader, as so you are being trained, the more you also strengthen other people, teach other people, lead other people, and also reveal to them the direction they ought to be going. Let's go back to the outline. Without strong leadership, the church easily falls back into the old worldly ways. Each generation of the children of Israel fell back into sin and idolatry. Whenever there was no God-given leader. That's very important. We may take care of other things, but if we do not take care of building up a strong leadership, anointed leadership, well-taught, well-trained leadership, all those other things we take care of eventually may crumble. And it is good to know that before Moses left, he, pay, he prayed that prayer. And he concentrated, he made sure that nothing diverted his attention from having a good leader over the people of God. I believe that Joshua did the same thing. Oh, you say, is there any record that he prayed specifically that God will raise up leaders? over the people of God after he, Joshua, had left? Well, there is no particular uh, prayer point that we can refer to. But, you know, before he left, he called the people together. And he gave them a challenge. And after he gave them the challenge, he made them to come to a commitment. And then after that, eventually, he left. But you know, in what I read to you before, let's go back to that passage, Judges chapter 2. Judges chapter 2, from verse 7 again. And the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua, and all the days of the elders that outlived Joshua. All the days of the elders that outlived Joshua. So Joshua too had been concerned. And God saw to it that he gave Israel the kind of leadership they ought to have. And then they continued following the Lord. Verse 8, and Joshua the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died being 110 years old. I think that's, that man was very old. I don't think many of us are up to half of that age already. 
Are there many people like that? 110. I think this should encourage you. If this man could still get all those people together and preach to them, and maybe you are just 35 now, or maybe you are just 45 now, maybe you are 55 or you are 60, and uh, you are saying, they should let me preach less. Because look at my age now. I'm 60 years of age. Well, I present Joshua to you. What if somebody just came and said, well, we thank God we have a preacher this morning, and he's a veteran preacher. He's, he has a lot of experience. He has fought many battles. We want him to tell us a lot of stories and how he waged that war and waged that war. Well, he may not be standing preaching. He may be sitting down and preaching, but let's hear from him. Here, I introduce to you the man of God, Joshua, and his age is 110. Then, you know, a leader is really coming to speak. Well, what I'm saying to you is, uh, if you are not up to 100 years yet, keep on preaching. Is that right? Don't feel that you are so getting old now, and you are weak, and you are tired. Keep on preaching. I believe the Lord who strengthened people like, people like Moses. You know, sometimes it surprises you, and we're still going to get to it on the outline. That Moses received his call at the age of 80. We think that if we're already 40 or 50 or 60 and we have not started, then we can never start. No, no age is too, is too old. You can get started anytime. You can still obey the Lord. Let's go on. In verse 9, And they buried him in the border of his inheritance in Timnath Harris, in the Mount of Ephraim, on the north side of the hill of Geash, and also all that generation were gathered unto their fathers. And, they are, and there arose another generation after them, which knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which he had done for Israel. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served barely. Why did things change? Things changed because leadership changed. The leadership that followed after Joshua, by the grace of God, they still kept the people. Because the people kept on serving the Lord, even the people that outlived Joshua. But then after that generation, another generation rose up. And the people did not know the importance of leadership. And when they failed on that area of leadership, every other thing failed. I pray that God will continue to help us as he has been helping us in this church in Jesus' name. Israel had no strength, no vision, no glory. Without the Lord ordaining leaders, kings, prophets, or judges to come to their aid, we need God-ordained and spirit-filled leaders to guide God's people in God-ordained direction. We are now on page 7. It is common for the average person to make good look evil. Or to make evil look good. What I mean is this. The average person on the street, and even the average person that comes to the church, who has not been well taught, it's common for such an individual to make good look evil. To make the sound doctrine of the Bible look as something that is irksome and difficult. Or to make evil something substandard, something anti-biblical. To make it look good. The church needs leadership that can bend the minds of men towards God. Towards purity. Towards holiness. It is easy to deceive the average church member and to lead him astray from the Lord and from sound doctrine. That's another reason why the church needs leaders who can be instruments of the Holy Spirit to keep the people of God in God's word. These are the last days. And the Bible tells us that the last days will witness great departure of many churches from godliness and from truth. Many churches may witness great display of human depravity and self-centeredness on anointed, uninspired teachers 
who are not called of God may thrust themselves into leadership in many churches. Therefore, today, we need true biblical leaders who are called by God and who daily experience the reality of the cross of Jesus Christ. We need leaders who walk in the footsteps of Jesus, who have divine ability to lead others to walk in the, in the same way. We need leaders who know and possess the ideal image pictured in the scriptures and who can bring the church back into such an image through Jesus Christ. We need leaders whose character is being daily molded by God and who can effectively lead the people of God in the church to, great, to the great creator, redeemer, porter, to be molded to the pattern of the heavenly. We need leaders who live at the foot of the cross, crucified and conquered, and who by the grace of God are divinely enabled, empowered, to take other people to that same foot of the cross of Jesus Christ. We need leaders today. What should our prayer be? Lord, make me a true leader. Shall we all say that together? Now we're going to emphasize the word Lord because, you know, is the only one that can do it. Is the only one that can make any of us here a true leader. Can we say that same thing but emphasize the word Lord? Now we're going to emphasize the word make. You know, when you're making something, it's a process. And when God makes leadership, he doesn't make leadership overnight. He builds. He corrects. Sometimes he chastises. But thank God, he always encourages, even within the chastisement. He loves. He gives promises. He gives encouragement. He does a lot of things in making us true leaders. Now we're going to say that same thing. We're praying. And we pray that God will make us true leaders, but we emphasize the word make. Now, let me uh, just give you an example of what I mean. We say, Lord, make me a true leader. You're trying to emphasize the word make. Do you understand? Let's say that again. Emphasize the word make now. Now we're going to emphasize the word me. You know, sometimes we can say something. You just say, Lord, make me a true leader. But when you look at yourself, and you want to be a true leader, and you look at your past trials and errors and difficulties and inconsistencies, and you know that you, except the Lord really wants to show supernatural love, superlative grace. If it were not the Lord, if it were man, he would have given up on any of us. Therefore, you say, Lord, I said that before, make me a true leader. I want to emphasize the word me. Now, can you do that? Oh, you are getting what I mean. Now, we want to emphasize the word true. You know, there are many leaders. But you don't want to be just a leader. And we say, that's one of the leaders in the church. That's one of the leaders in deeper life. That's one of the leaders among the people of God. You know the kind of leader you want to be. You want to emphasize the word true. Can you do that? Wonderful. And you know, a leader... Real, real, real leader. God will make you. Yeah. Say this last sentence and put all your strength in that leader. You will lead. By the grace of God, you will lead. Yeah. And you will lead the people of God into the heaven of rest. Into the place where God has appointed for the people of God. You are like a shepherd. You are like a captain. You are like a ruler. You are, you are like a leader, and you are like a pilot. You are piloting the people of God. We know where we are going. The place is far, but you will not get tired by the way. Yeah. Until those pearly gates open and you lead the people of God in, and then you look back, you see that every person the Lord put in your care 
everybody has entered. Then you raise up your hand, you begin to praise the Lord. The Lord has made me a true what? Let's say this last sentence and put your emphasis on the word leader. God will do it. Amen. I just uh, did that with you so that you will still be able to continue later and you will do that. And if you pray this prayer, God is going to answer. Doesn't matter how many mistakes you have made in leadership before. Doesn't matter. You might even be saying, let them put another person there. I am not qualified. Moses said he was not qualified to you, but you just pray the prayer and the Lord will do what he ought to do. Now let me go to study one. The true biblical leader. We have read Numbers chapter 27. Let us look at it again. Numbers chapter 27. Reading from verse 15 to verse 17. And, the, and Moses spake unto the Lord, saying, Let the Lord the God of the spirits of all flesh, set a man over the congregation, which may go out before them, and which may go in before them, and which may lead them out, and which may bring them in, and that the congregation of the Lord be not a sheep without with no shepherd. The church leaders need to have fresh revelation on who true biblical leaders are. Popular notions of church leadership seem to center on non-Christian concepts of leadership. God has given certain principles in his word by which church leadership is to function. Yet very often, executive business principles take priority over specific scriptural guidelines in many minds. Carry over models from the world brought into the church, often rob the church of her spiritual strength, power, and impact. Emphasis on secular knowledge rather than scripture. Emphasis on mechanical methods rather than spiritual ministry. Emphasis on professional training rather than Holy Spirit unction. Emphasis on committees and boards rather than inspiration and revelation. Emphasis on brainstorming meetings rather than prayer meetings has tended to paralyze the church of God. The constant danger of the world's model of leadership in the church is that it tends to replace God's ways with man's ways and can ultimately lead to spiritual destitution. So, we want to think about the true biblical leader. And I want to tell you that there are, there's leadership in the world, but then we do not carry the model of the world. We do not carry that model into the church. Our emphasis should still be what a biblical leader ought to look like. Because if we do not consider biblical leadership, if we bring models from the world, it can lead us to spiritual destitution. Let us think about this. Number one, the definition and description of a biblical leader. Number two, the call of a leader. Number one, definition and description of a biblical leader. What I will do is this. I will read some of the references we have here. I've told you before, I'm not going to be able to read everything because of our time. And then, from those uh, references we read, we'll then be bringing out the concept of leadership that we see from those references. Let's look at Numbers again, 27, now verse 17 which may go out before them, which may go in before them, which may lead them out, and which may bring them in. Congregation of the Lord, be not a sheep without, which have no shepherd. From the 
description there, you will see the functions of the leader. You will see the descriptive title of the leader. The roles and responsibilities of the leader. We'll say more about that later, but then let us look at 2 Samuel chapter 5, verse 2. Also, in time past, when Saul was king over us, thou wast he that ledest out and broughtest in Israel. And the Lord said unto thee, Thou shalt feed my people Israel. Thou shalt be a captain over Israel. If you notice the first reference I read in Numbers, it gives the descriptive title of shepherd. Here in this passage we have read, the descriptive title is captain. Then if you notice in Numbers, it talks of leading them out, bringing them in, going before them. Now over here, it still talks about leading out and bringing in, and also says, Thou shalt feed my people Israel, and shall be a captain over them. Remember that word, captain, over them. Now Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 7. Remember them that have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. Verse 17. Obey them that have the rule over you, and submit yourselves for the watch for your souls, as they that must give account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. Already we have seen the descriptive title of shepherd. Descriptive title of captain. Over here in Hebrews 13, 7, we see another descriptive title, ruler. Them which have rule over you. Therefore, the leader is like a ruler. It's like a governor. Also, which have spoken unto you the word of God. In the other passages we read, it talks about feeding the people. Here it tells us very pointedly and clearly that feeding the people of God is speaking the word of God unto them. Then in the other passage it says, they go before you and they also bring you in. Over here it says, they manifest faith in the Lord and you follow their faith. They are leading you because they are walking by faith. And now you that are the people that are ruled and controlled and led of these leaders, you follow their faith, considering the end of their conversation. That is the result of their manner of life. Verse 17 talks about the leader in another way. Although it uses the word having rule over you, but it brings us the, uh, the leader now as a commander that gives out command, that gives out instruction, and that gives out the things that the people of God ought to do and where to obey. Therefore, the leader here is pictured as a commander, as a captain in the army, and that we are to submit ourselves. But then verse 17 also says, it's a watchman. It's a watchman. And it's watching over your soul. And it will give account if enemies get into the territory and they snatch any of us away. Therefore, as we look at all these, and there are others we can still read. Maybe this is very important, and I should look at it. In Acts of the Apostles, chapter 20. Acts, chapter 20, verse 28. Take ye therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock, over the which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers 
to feed the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. Here he gives us the descriptive title of overseer. Now, the biblical concept of leadership sets forth the leader as a shepherd. It also sets forth the leader as a captain. Sets forth the leader as a ruler. And sets him up as an overseer. There are other descriptions and titles of a leader in the church. The Bible calls the leader servant of God and servant of his church. The Bible calls the leader minister of the mysteries of God. The Bible calls the leader steward and calls the leader elder. But these imply that a leader, now from all these descriptive titles, what do we know of the leader? As we try to give a definition, we know this, number one, a leader is one who goes ahead and acts as a guiding force. Think about yourself as a leader. We preach, that's wonderful. We counsel, that's wonderful. But is that the totality of our leadership? No, not at all. We are always to go ahead of the people as a guiding force. Guiding the people of God too. The leader is one who gives direction and structure to others' work and efforts. You think of the leader as a captain. And you think of the people of God as an army. It is not the captain that fights all the battle. But then he structures the responsibilities of members of that battalion. So that they'll be able to concentrate their efforts in the goal that the captain is sharing with them. Number three, the leader is one who motivates and leads the people towards a certain purpose. When you think of a leader, you are thinking of an individual who knows where we are going, who knows by the grace of God how to get there, who knows by the grace of God the resources we each need to possess so we can get there? And who knows how to motivate us, how to direct us, challenge us, and lead the people in a certain direction to achieve that certain purpose, goal, or course of action? Number four, the leader is one who holds authority to lead others. When you talk of a ruler, you are talking of a person that has authority. That is why it will be unfortunate. If we say we have a leader anywhere in the church, in any community of the church, however small, however large, and we take all responsibility and authority away from that leader, that he has no mouth to talk. He has no chance to give any direction. He has no chance to be able to say, people of God, this is the way, this is a place to go. A leader in a state, a leader in a region, a leader in a district, a leader in a local church needs to be given the authority to lead. How does he lead? By instruction and correction. He will, you cannot correct if they have not done anything wrong. First, you give instruction. If now the people are not carrying out the instruction properly, part of your leadership is still to correct and say, this is what the Bible says. And this is what we have said. According to the word of God, the leader will lead by instruction and by correction. I'm now on page 8. And also by means of persuasion and example. Now let us pick up some of the titles, descriptive titles, so that these descriptive titles, as we look in depth into them, will help us to see what are the, what is the definition more, and what is the description, what are the functions and the roles and the responsibilities of a biblical leader. Let's pick up the descriptive title of a shepherd, as a shepherd or overseer. The leader feeds and directs the people of God. From the picture of the shepherd psalm, a true leader or shepherd of God's people, number one, 
brings the sheep to green pastures of good spiritual diet. Now think of yourself as a leader. Over the people of God, don't starve the people. Get into the green pastures of the word of God. Dig it out. Prepare it. Structure it. Know the needs of the people. And know the cardinal things of the gospel. And make sure that their spiritual lives are well taken care of. They need to be born again. They need to be sanctified. They need to be baptized in the Holy Ghost. They need their faith to increase. They need to know the will of the Lord and the way of the Lord in marriage. They need to know how to serve the Lord. They need to know that the Lord is coming. Look at spiritual diet, good spiritual diet in the word of God. Bring it out and bring the sheep to the grain pasture. Number two, the shepherd, the leader, leads the sheep beside pure, clean, restful waters of the word and of the Holy Spirit. You see what we're told about the shepherd, especially in those biblical days is that he will first of all go ahead of the flock and will make sure that any kind of noisy stream that will terrify the sheep, he will dam it, D-A-M. He will do something so that he'll, the thing will become quietly flowing, so that the terror or the fear is taken away because the sheep could be fearful how we should do that. That we as leaders, we have the responsibility of taking the fear out of the people. Let the people of God fear God. Don't let them fear the devil. Let the people of God have only referential fear for leadership, but take the fear of the slave away from them. Let the people of God, let the leadership in the church lead the church beside the pure water the clean water, the quiet, restful waters of the word of God, so that as you as the leader, when you come in, the people are resting in their mind. Oh, they say, our leader has come. He's going to quieten our fears. He's going to lead us in the right direction. Number three, restores the souls and the lives of the weary, the failing, and the despondent members. Number four, guides the sheep in the right path to know and to do and to enjoy God's perfect will in all things and at all times. That is why we praise God for the leadership of this church. The leadership of this church, I would say, almost in every community and locality, all the leadership have been busy teaching the people of God that will to know the will of God. I don't know yet, there may be, I don't know yet any other church that teaches that the people of God should know the will of God in marriage. Know the will of God in your career. Know the will of God in decisions to take. I don't know any other church that emphasizes that more than we do here in Deeper Life. Almost any member of Deeper Life, by the time he spends a short time in Deeper Life, our leaders would have taught him or her, we need to know the will of God. Keep on doing it. Keep on doing it. A leader must know how to guide the sheep in the right path so that the people of God will know and they will do and they will enjoy God's perfect will, not only in marriage, in all things and at all times. Number five, leaders, the leader should be able to comfort the sheep with the rod of correction, not rod of destruction, the rod of correction. And you know, sometimes you may not intend it, that you are correcting an individual if you do not manifest love at the same time, gentleness at the same time, humility at the same time, what you intend to be for correction may end up being for destruction. Let's be watchful. And also the staff of protection, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Let's make sure that as leaders, we have the rod of correction, but at the same time, the staff of protection, protect them that they will not get so despondent, they will give up the faith. Number six, the leader prepares satisfying diet to keep the sheep from wandering away from the flock. You see, if the people are hungry, 
Every time they hear that an evangelist comes to town from any place, they like to go there. They say, maybe I will get what I've never got in our church here. But if we expose the people of God to the totality of the word of God, whoever is coming to our community from that place or that place, the people just rest because they know that the leader in that place has exposed them to everything by the grace of God the Bible provides for us. Number seven, the leader anoints the head of his, of his chief with the protective oil of the spirit. Why? You know, in those days, this is what I've seen in write-ups and history. In those days, they, sometimes the sheep, as they go about in the bush or in the wilderness, the flies and other kinds of insects will be hovering around them. And they disturb the sheep a lot. Therefore, what the shepherd will do is to put oil on them. And a kind of oil that will be able to shield all the flies and the insects away. So that they will not be bothering the sheep. You know, there are demons. Evil spirits. That may come to attack the people of God. Come in the day, come in the night. But the leader will know how to teach the people of God much of the Spirit of God. Anoint them with the protective oil of the Spirit so that these evil spirits, they will have no place amidst the people of God and in the church of God in Jesus' name. Now, that's something we learn from the picture of the shepherd. How about the picture of the captain, the ruler, and the elder? Let's look at this. From the picture of the captain, the ruler, the elder, the leader, or leadership in the church must have eyes that can discern those who are called to a particular work in the church and be able to release them to that work. You see, as leaders, we're always looking for people to develop. We must always be looking for people that show talent, that reveal the call of God upon their lives, that show evidence of the touch of the Lord, the hand of the Lord. And we are always looking for ways and means of releasing them into such a ministry and work. In learning to recognize and release others to minister according to their calling, the leader will do the seven things. Number one, the leader will recognize the ability and the potential in each person. Don't look for them to be exactly like you are. Because you may not possess everything that the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the teacher, the pastor possess all together. God has raised you up as a leader in your own capacity. But some of these people you are bringing up may be revealing or manifesting some other leadership qualities in some other areas of ministry. Recognize it. Recognize the ability and the potential in each person. Number two, focus on positive areas in each person. You see, if you are going to train other people, if you are going to release them to the ministry that God is calling them to, you have to de-emphasize. You have to put under the carpet the negative things. If you are looking at the negative things and you are hammering on them and talking on them all the time, you will forget the positive side. Focus on the positive areas in each person's life so that that will help you to see what to develop. Although if the negative will destroy the positive, you will know how to work on the negative in such a fatherly manner. Is such a style that will not destroy the positive qualities of the life of that individual. Number three, challenge each person to fulfill his potential and to develop his gifts. Challenge them. Don't be quiet. If you see something good, if you see a potential, if you see a gift, if you see something coming up or not yet well developed in a leader under you, in some workers under you, don't keep quiet. Just tell them, brother, looks like a, you're a potential teacher. Brother, you talk like an evangelist. 
Brother, it, it appears that if you give the prayer intercessory uh, ministry in, that is growing up in your life, if you give it more time, you can do a lot by prayer. Because I believe the Lord is raising you up for something like that. But be watchful before you say it. Don't just say it just to say it. Because you see, if you say it just to say it, and it is not real, it will be insincerity. And people recognize insincerity. Let us be sincere about it, and let us tell the truth to the people so that they'll know the right things to be developing in their lives. Number four, be willing to spend much time and labor upon each person. Even be willing to be frustrated with each person without giving up on him. You know, if Jesus would have given up on Peter, but Jesus accepted to be frustrated, if we use that language, with all the inconsistencies in Peter's life, and he just kept on and on and on and on. Even when he had done the greatest thing that we thought he could have ever done, when he denied the Lord, and with an oath, and even swore. I mean, the ordinary Christian is even told not to swear at all, whether by your head, or by Jerusalem, or by anything. And to swear that he never knew Jesus. I mean, it was the greatest lie that you could ever have imagined. When Jesus rose from the dead, he said, go and tell my disciples, and then he mentioned Peter in particular. I think if it were any of us, we would have given up on Peter. You see, James and John, I mean, what they did, we are all students of the Bible, and we're all preachers. They knew it was wrong. Jesus said it was wrong. The other ten disciples, they said it was wrong. But, you know, I, have, I had a little problem on that uh, passage. You know, here is uh, James, and he came on the one side, and John came on the one side, and they looked around, they saw the other ten people were not around, and he said, Jesus, we have a special request. And if we can settle this deal before these other people come, let's say, if I stay on this side and then my brother will stay on this side. And Jesus said, that, how are you thinking about this? Are you able to drink the cup? Oh, yes. Let's answer all the questions quickly before they come. Oh, yes. Uh, you know, we can drink the cup. And uh, are you able to, you know, be baptized for this thing? I'll be baptized. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, we can. And Jesus said, yes, you can. And you will. But to see it on my right hand and to see it on my left hand is not mine to give. But to be given to whom the Lord has prepared it. Now the thing that bothered me is this. Then the other ten, they came and they heard about it. And it said they were full of what? Tell me out loud. Now the thing that bothered me is that one of those people that were filled with indignation is Judas Iscariot. He had his own plan. And he was worse than these other two people. And when these other two people said, I want to sit down there, I want to sit down there, Judas also was angry. Uh, you know, many of us, you are angry about other leaders and say, that leader did not do well, that leader did not do well. Well, thank God you are not Judas Iscariot. But you know, some of us have our problems too. And Jesus called out all of them. He didn't give up on them. He said, forget it. God will place every one of you where he ought to place you. He didn't give up on them just because they got angry and they had indignation. Sometimes we give up too quickly on leaders in the church. Workers that were raising up in the church. Or it may be a member of the choir. It may be an usher. It may be one of the, you know, location pastors. It may be one of the leaders we are raising up. And we have high hopes. And then they did something we didn't expect. Or they said something we didn't ex expect. Then we become so frustrated and we lose them. And we say, you can never be. They can be if you are patient. And God will make them to be if you are patient. So let us endure. And let us make sure that we keep on spending much time and much labor in prayers. Even in the time of frustration, limit what you say. You may be frustrated because of a particular person you are trying to train, you are trying to bring up. Even when you are disappointed, don't always show it. Go back to the Lord and say, Lord, if it were you, 
Would you still be more patient? If it were you, will you still give more time to pray and to develop and to train these people? And Jesus will follow the pattern of Jesus Christ. Number five, encourage each person in times of weakness and mistake. And keep planting a bright vision in his heart. I believe that once in a while, almost everybody, I should have said everybody actually, but let me just say almost. I believe that once in a while, almost everybody may get so discouraged like Moses and say, Lord, take me away. I cannot lead these people. They are incorrigible. They are this and they are that. In your leadership career, you will find that sometimes in the church, the local church where you are, or maybe the region where you are, or maybe the state where you are, or maybe the nation where you are, wherever God places you as a leader, you may become so frustrated that you cannot lead these people. And the same thing, understand that the leaders under you too may feel like that. And when they feel like that, and they come to you and they say, remove me from being a leader. I don't think I can do it. Don't agree with them. Don't agree with them. When Moses went to God and he said, I cannot lead the people. I cannot do it. You know, he said that at the beginning and God gave him Aaron. God didn't say, okay, you say you cannot do it. That's all right, you cannot do it. Never agree with the people that they cannot do what God wants them to do. Never agree with the people that grace will not be sufficient. Never agree with the people that they will just live mediocre life and they should just give up everything the Lord wants them to achieve in leadership. And even later, after Moses had started, and he said, well, I cannot be all these people alone. Am I the one that gave back to them? Are you living? If I have found grace in your sight, just say, if possible, take me away and all that. And God said, I know your problem. You need more assistance. Those 70 people, gather them together. And you are the one that will still lay your hands on them. And then I will pass some of the spirit on you, upon them. You will still be the leader, but then now they will assist you. The same thing, if God will not give up on a person like Moses, or other people, you don't give up on anyone. I pray that when situations come in your leadership life, that a person you might be tempted to give up on, you will remember what we are saying today. And you will not give up. And yourself too, when you feel like giving up, don't go and tell the church. You see, the church is not matured. What I mean is, it's not everybody in the church that is matured. Some of them are well matured and very wise, and we praise God for them. But you know, in a church, there will be young converts, there will be young people. If you are tired, don't go to the pulpit and say, Church, this morning, I am tired. Because, you know, the following day, you may become strong. And then when you are strong the following day, they are still carrying the news about and they are saying, Pastor said he's tired. And uh, the following months, uh, even after you are now jumping up and by the grace of God, your vision is now bright and everything is okay, the people, the immature people, they are still carrying story, they are still saying that you said you are tired. If you come back and you said, I am not tired anymore. Some of the people that were in church when you said you were tired, they are not in church today. They are for those other people not around, they are still carrying their story. When you are tired, don't talk to a man, talk to God. And Moses spoke to God when he was tired. And when he had a problem, and God strengthened him. And God will strengthen you in Jesus' name. Amen. Then the person you are developing, give him opportunities for development and put confidence in his ministry. That is, give him opportunities to preach, opportunities to lead, opportunities to have responsibility. And when he does something, he may not do it perfectly. You know that he's just starting. You know that he didn't occupy that position of responsibility before. Don't chew him out and knock him down and say, you spoiled the whole world. The first opportunity I gave you, look at what you have done. Be gentle on him and spot out the positive things that he did well. Emphasize that. And then when he's happy that at least he tried a little, then you will say, but you will become a better leader if you are taking care of this area, this area, and this area. Number seven, pray for him. And I think this is something we have to consider very well. Take 
the leaders under you and the workers under you. Take them to the throne of grace one by one. Pray for them constantly. Pray for each one until he becomes a well-trained, disciplined soldier in the Lord's army, a well-equipped member of the body, and a well-equipped minister in the body who is so well prepared that he will be able to equip others in the kingdom of God and for his glory. The question I want to ask as we have looked at all these functions, all these rules, all these descriptions about the true biblical leader is the question that Paul the Apostle asked. And it's the question, who is sufficient for these things? The answer is, there is no one. But we can be what we ought to be by the grace of God. At the next session of the leadership studies, we'll continue. For now, we'll rise up. I will talk to the Lord, who is sufficient for these things. O oh Lord, make me a true leader. In myself, I cannot do it. In myself, I cannot measure up. Given my limited ability, it is not in my power to measure. But you can qualify me. You can assist me. You can help me. He will. He will. He has called us, He has chosen us. If you are tired, don't tell men, tell the Lord. You are weary. You are afflicted. The going is not easy in leadership. Tell the Lord. He will sustain you. He will energize you. He will enable you. He will fill you with all the resources of heaven. Tell the Lord. Tell the Lord. A true biblical leader. True biblical leader. Wherever you are, you can do what God wants you to do. Present your discouragements to the Lord. Present your anxieties to the Lord. And you tell the Lord to develop all these leadership qualities in you. So that you will be a real shepherd. A real captain. A godly leader and ruler. A godly watchman over the people of God. An equipped minister of the gospel. A steward of the mysteries of God. You can do it. You can do it. Lord, make me a true leader.
In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our Father and our God, we thank you for this great revelation of your word to us. Lord, you've shown us from the Bible what a true leader should be. Lord, you have wet our appetites. And Lord, our desires are great. That Lord, we want you to make us the true leader. Lord, we want to be true leaders to our people. And we've seen the qualities of what the true leaders should be, of what is expected of the true leader. And Lord, like the Apostle Paul, we're saying who is sufficient unto all these things. But Lord, also like Apostle Paul, we're saying we can do all things through Christ that strengthens us. Right now, Lord, we're saying, begin that work in us and make us true leaders in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, in making us true leaders, there are things you will need to knock off our lives. And here we are. We say, Lord, do it in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, there are things you will need to take off. There are things you will need to cut off. There are things you will need to prune. There are areas you will need to really work very hard in our lives. Father, we lay our lives before you and we say, go ahead and do all that you want to do, but make us true leaders in Jesus' name. Amen. We know you will do it. And we thank you because you have answered us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I believe you have been blessed. Don't let this message die. Listen to it again and pass it to others. You can get more from God at the Deeper Life Bible Church. Our headquarters is Deeper Life Bible Church, Bagada, Lagos, Nigeria. Blessed are your ears for hearing these things. We'll meet in heaven if you do them. <laughs>